glad to see every single one of you. Um, let's see, uh, Mick is gonna read first. Lowell McQuaid is author of three books, the novel Professed, which I think he's reading from today. Um, the novel That Demon Life, which won the Javal Press Novel Award. And the story collection, Long Time Ago Good. Mick was a Dobie Paisano fellow and now teaches at Texas A&M uh, University. He's also, I think, a co-founder of the Alamo Bay Press, as I, I just sort of learned today. I asked him for some um, factoid about himself that I could use to introduce him to, to just say more than what I just said. And, and he didn't oblige, you know. So I have to come up with my own, and this is my, this is my Mick White story. Um, to understand this, you have to know, first of all, that Mick and I are members of the same team in a certain sense. That is that we've both been published by the same small press for an earlier book, book of his and, and one of mine. So um, we have a sense of supporting each other's efforts. Um, and that's uh, partly why I'm introducing him. <clears throat> Another thing you have to know to understand the story about Mick White is that I was this year the, um, a finalist for a literary prize that I did not win, which I'm okay with that. I try not to take these things uh, too seriously. Um, when I then ran into Mick White, uh, and he, he knew about this, and I knew he knew about this, uh, he looks at me and he says, you was robbed. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I said, well, you know, I try not to take these things too seriously, make it so okay, and, and I really like the guy who won, and, and it's a good book by the guy who won, so that's cool. So he listens to me patiently, and he looks at me and he says, you was robbed. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my Mick White story. Um, Without further ado, Mick White. Okay. Okay. I want to do a picture first. Uh, iOS 10, I don't like. Uh, you're all beautiful. You're all beautiful too. You could have added for so I didn't see the email asking for for a detail, so I must have everyone must have gone straight by me because I didn't. Well, you don't read your email very carefully. Yeah, that's true. I don't. <laughs> I know that. Right? Yeah, I uh, know. A couple from me. <laughs> um, you can tell but, us your best personal anecdote now. Well, I, okay. I was going to say here's, here's something sort of literary. Uh, my novel, my Javal Press novel, that Demon Life. The guy who judged it was John Dominey. Yay! Thank you, John. And also, when I got the Dobby Prize Honor Terrific. Fellowship, you were a judge that year. Is that oh, right? Yeah, oh, so thank you. So I got people who helped me out all these years. And I appreciate it. And you rock. <laughs> <laughs> she was. She was <laughs> rock. Um, one read from uh, Professed. Um, it's a, a novel of a novel of higher education, it says on, on the cover. And it's set at a large university here in Austin. Um, and uh, there are three narrators. There's a, a guy who's an adjunct or you know postdoc, and there's an assistant professor who's coming up on tenure, and there's an undergraduate. Um, and I'm going to read it. There's a few little short scenes from it that sort of go together. Um, if you go up to my car right now, you'll see, you'll see a tote bag that's full of student work. Uh, I've got about 50 student papers to read. Um, 25 essays and about 25 short stories as well. And so, you know, that's part of the job. But, uh, uh, so Grady takes up part of this book. I'll read a couple of parts on that. Start off with. The grading never stopped. <laughs> Papers kept coming and coming. A blizzard of grading. A hurricane, an avalanche, a tsunami, an earthquake. A dirigible explosion, a plane crash, a train wreck, a terrorist attack. A disaster of grading. <laughs> Everybody I know hates grading. Even the instructors and professors who claim to love their students and whom they actually love teaching after all, even they hate grading. It's tough to judge and assess people and then look them in the eye day after day. And beneath that is a cold, lurking fear of getting a bad evaluation from an unhappy student, a bad evaluation that can actually doom your career. 
One or two bad evaluations from terrible students can get a non-tenured faculty member's contract canceled, and the teacher can find her or his ass out on the street with no job, no job prospects, and $150,000 or so of student debt to pay off. And grading is still worse than that, even. Grading affects the health of the teachers, too. Meet some afternoon with 14 or 18 students to discuss their terrible papers, and you'll be sick the next day. Students are notoriously filthy vectors of cold and flu viruses. They can be depressed, too, worrying for the fate of the Republic after you've read students who assert that their mind is made up, made M-A-I-D, or that they are not ta taking something for granted, or <laughs> arguing that Hitler did some good things, like Bill Rhodes, and anyway, it was God that judged the Jews, not Hitler, or who are just plain lazy. Quote, both of these stories that I am comparing have similarities that me as a reader will know about when I finish reading them, end quote. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not kidding about depression. Grade 30 or 50 papers and you will feel low, sullen, tired. You'll feel like a loser, like a horrible teacher, like a total failure. The good papers, and yeah, there are some good papers always, won't cheer you up because the bad papers are bad, bad, bad. They're terrible. And they're terrible because you're a terrible teacher. <laughs> it's depressing. A year ago here, an adjunct jumped off the west side of the football stadium and killed himself. His suicide even, no, even made the chronicle of higher education. He blamed Grady for his depression, not lousy adjunct pay or not having health insurance. Grady is a killer. So that narrator there is a guy named Tom Holt, who's a, a postdoc, uh, who's struggling, teaching, three classes at UT and three classes at ACC and also attending bar two nights a week, so, he, so he's struggling. Uh, another narrator is a guy named Travis who is a uh, undergraduate, he has a, a paper due on Thursday. Uh, his part of the novel takes place on Tuesday and Wednesday, he hasn't started his paper yet. Uh, and uh, uh, so he goes to Holt, his former composition teacher, asking for some advice. Uh, I don't have a problem, I said. I just wanted some advice about a paper. A paper? Holt was staring at me again. A paper we did last semester? No, no, I said. A paper I'm writing this semester for a different class. For a class I'm taking this semester. I've got, Holt sagged again. He stared past me. I've got like 180 students. And I thought, well, one more won't hurt then. <laughs> then I remembered what Dr. Broughton had been saying about how the corporatists, the edu-capitalists, were ruining my education. And now here was the proof. Poor Dr. Holt, poor Dr. Holt is overnumbered and sad, 180 students. I said, that's too many. Holt said, yeah. But you know, I know this history professor, Pete Broughton, he was telling me that the humanities are getting totally screwed over, that classes are too big, you guys don't get paid enough. Yeah, Holt said, no kidding. So I said, I was trying to think fast. Some crank would have helped. Uh, so, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe here's your chance to fight back, right? Subvert the corporation. Do your job. Educate. He laughed at that. Oh, come on. You're a professor, right? I asked. Profess me. <laughs> I'm not a professor, he said. I'm a lecturer. I'm a nobody. Same difference, I said. I was, <laughs> I was pretty sure it was the same difference. They're all teachers of some sort. I said, it's still your job, right? What happens here changes the fucking world. <laughs> he didn't say anything, though. Didn't even look at me. I sat there waiting for a bit. My roommate always told me to go ahead and ask for things, ask people for things. They can always say no. It's for Dr. Braddock's class, I said. I just wanted to run some ideas past you. It's no big deal. Hope looked like he was in pain. I mean, like in class, you always said to talk through our essays when we got stuck. So here I am, I'm stuck. Have you uh, talked to uh, Dr. Braddock about it, Holt asked? Nah, her office hours, you know, I can't come in then. I mean, they were in the fucking morning. Of course I couldn't come in then. <laughs> but she wrote on my proposal. I pulled out everything from my messenger bag, all my paper junk, the stupid uh, uh, Jackson biography, Dr. Braddock's book, William Getzman's West of the Imagination, my notebook, a folder of a bunch of papers. I pulled the proposal from the folder, looked at it, then pushed across the table to Holt. Look to my book's work cited for some sources, Holt said, reading. So she wants you to write something original. Yeah, I said, that was the problem, originality. She already wrote the fucking book. I said, but you know, I really don't like this topic I'm starting on. Holt said, well, then why write it? 
fucking cold. Sitting there across the table from me, it was easy for him. No pressure at all, no paper due the next day, no other classes to be maybe failed, no tiredness, weirdness, weirdness, nothing looming over him, no nothing. Holt took the Getzman book and began looking through it. So what would you want to write about this stuff anyway? Uh, I said I thought maybe Dr. Braddock would like it if I read her book. Holt said, she'd like it better if you just write a good paper. He wasn't even looking at me. He was looking at pictures, pictures of the book. From where I sat, it looked like a Remington painting. Yeah, I asked. I mean, write something about your care about, Holt said. <sighs> oh, shit. What did I fucking care about? That was the whole problem with everything, really, with my whole goddamn life, what I cared about. I started college as a journalism major, then switched to history because journalists were stupid. Then I switched again to English because I liked to read. I mean, basically, all I wanted to do with my life was to read books and bullshit about them, then fuck around at night and get loaded. What was the harm in that? <laughs> so, so he does write it. He, of course, the story, uh, uh, young Travis is a witness to a murder. He tells Holt about his murder, or about the murder he witnessed, and Holt says, why are you writing this stupid paper you're never going to finish? Write about the murder. And so uh, Travis sort of sees that as a, a possibility. And uh, this is a proposal. He's taking a class in Western literature, or Western United States literature. Uh, so Tom's, I mean, uh, Travis's proposal is, on January 1st of this year, I witnessed the murder of Dwayne Richard Hans, age 21. In the time since then, I've been trying to figure out what it all means, and I'm still not sure what to think, but it has something to do with a narrative of violence. In my paper, I'll compare what happened to me to what happened to Donnie and the Big Lebowski and to Paul when a river runs through it. I think it's what happens after the death that's more important than the deaths themselves, and that is what I will write about. So then he goes to his professor, uh, Dr. Braddock, and so it's on the last page or two to read of that. Um, sit down, Dr. Braddock said. She was looking at me. The only other chair in the room had a big orange Tomcat stretched out and it's dozing. That's French, she said. You can move him. I scooped the cat up and sat down on the chair. Fred the cat stayed limp in my lap. He began to purr. So, Dr. Braddock said, what's up? Well, I don't have anything for you, I said. I might as well tell the truth. I want to change my topic. I mean, I have a proposal. I offered her the blue folder while I steadied Fred the cat with my other hand. You have a proposal, Dr. Braddock said. She was sort of half smiling, maybe. For a paper that's due today. For a paper that's due right now. Yeah, I said. I guess I'll have to take it incomplete, too, if I can. Okay, Dr. Braddock said. She was looking at me. So, you don't think you can finish the paper this afternoon? Uh, no. How about before I turn in grades in next week? <sighs> she was fucking with me. And I guess I deserved it. Yeah, I did. I just shook my head. I leaned forward and dropped the proposal on her desk, and she took it and put her glasses on and looked at it. It took maybe two seconds. And I told her the story. Not as much as I told Holt, I just told her the important parts. And Dr. Braddock listened. The big cat stretched out across my lap. Well, the incomplete's not that big a deal, Dr. Braddock said at last. She took her glasses off and let them hang. Just leaves me with one less paper to grade, and it'll turn into an F automatically if you don't do anything. Okay, I said. But about your proposal, she put her glasses back on and looked at the sheet of paper for far longer than it would take to read it. You compare what you witnessed, or what you experienced, what happened to Donnie and to Paul in the text you cite, but they're fictional characters who died, right? And you're real, and you didn't die, so you're not really like them at all, are you? You're not the ultimate victim here in the story. Uh, I said, blushing. Why did she always make me blush? I said, I guess not. No. Yeah, I think he just worded that clumsily, Dr. Braddock said. You might want to take some more time and think a bit when you actually write the paper. OK, I said. I wonder, though, how you're going to pull this off. Dr. Braddock waited a long time, but I didn't say anything. Didn't have anything to say. I was wondering that, too, actually, a little. She said, it's a big topic, could be a really good essay, or a book maybe, but the problem you have is something that all young writers have, and I know this because I was once a young writer too, and that's being shallow. I sat as far back as I could, the cat on the, the fuck? <laughs> shallow? Did she just call me stupid? Now, I don't mean that in a negative way, Dr. Braddock said. I just mean you can't help it. Young people are, are young. They don't have context, perspective, or experience. Well, I'm working on that. I said, you know, my project, my life, my me. Sure, she said. But if you're doing the gonna do this right, you're gonna have to figure out what it all means, what it meant, the death of Braddock looked at the proposal. Hans, I said, Hans, what is death meant? 
and what it means to you, and what his life meant to him and to his family. And to do it right, you're gonna to have to do more than just compare and contrast uh, the event with these two texts. You're gonna to have to think. It's gonna be hard, right? It might take years. It might take a lifetime to find the meaning. I sat there, it was back to meaning again. Meant, fuck. I sat there, I didn't say anything. But I think you should do it, I said. She said, it just won't be easy. Okay, I said. I can still agree with her. She was doing me a favor. And she probably knew more about writing essays or writing anything than I did. It was easiest just to sit there and agree with her. Yeah, Dr. Braddock was leaning over the desk toward me, smiling, okay, okay? Yeah, I said, sure, whatever, okay. Okay, okay? I'll stop right there. <laughs>